Welcome into the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. We have a great interview teed up for you today. We pride ourselves here at the OG Pod for going right to the source, going right to the OGs themselves. And we have one of the true OGs of the New York law enforcement space, somebody who was a superstar in the Manhattan Prosecutor's Office, Robert Silbering. This guy uh, is a legend and led the Manhattan District Attorney Drug Task Force throughout the 1990s. He was the top drug prosecutor in all of New York City. Robert, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure, Scott. Very nice to be here with you. Well, you know, this guy has literally done it all and seen it all. I usually say that after an interview, but I'm I'm so blown away by his career. Let's just kind of start with that. Uh, started as a uh, paralegal, right, Robert? Yes, that's correct. In in the Manhattan uh, DA's office, and then what twenty or uh, ten years later, twenty years later. Well, you know, I had an interesting career, Scott. Uh, it's sort of a, a Horatio Alger story. I started as a paralegal. I worked my up. I uh, tried some cases, murder cases, and so forth. And then in New York, the because juvenile crime had become so bad in New York, the governor passed a law allowing DAs to go into the family court and prosecute violent juvenile offenders. And while I was there, I met the number two person in the uh, New York City Corporation Council. Those were the lawyers who the city had prosecuting juveniles and and who that happened to be none other than Judge Judy. Yeah. yeah I, so let's just tell people real quick and then we'll we'll get back to it at the end. Robert uh, has a book out called Law and Disorder. Um, this is something that, you know, every true crime fan needs to get their hands on. Uh, it gives you the whole story of his career, all the big cases that he did. It's called Law and Disorder, How a Kid from the Bronx Became America's Top Prosecutor, Top Drug Prosecutor. And if you look at the blurbs on the book, they come from quite a, a who's who of big time legal names. And you said Judge Judy uh, being one of them. So I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah. So anyway, she was there. And uh, I started prosecuting these violent juveniles. And within six months after I'm there, two page one murder cases come in. One involved uh, what they call the laughing boy murder case, where this 15 year old seminary student gets uh, he's standing on a street corner with his friend. And this 13 year old boy comes up and says, what are you laughing at? And the kid says, I'm not laughing at anything. The 13 year old takes out a gun, shoots him in the head. Four days later, he dies. Uh, it was a very tragic case, page one murder case. But the, the bigger case was a kid by the name of Willie Boskett. And there's been a book written about him and his family where they traced, it's called All God's Children. It was it traced his family back to the plantation where they took their name in the 1850s. And all it is is you see generation after generation of violent crimes committed by this family. His father, a guy by the name of Butch Boskett, was in Milwaukee. He kills two people in a pawn shop murder, gets convicted, goes to jail, escapes jail, gets into a shootout with the cops and dies in that shootout. Willie idolized his father. He was in trouble from the age of like seven on. And what he did, he and his cousin would go in the subways in New York and they would find sleeping people and rob them. And if the guy got up, he would shoot him in the head and kill him. He had uh, killed uh, two people, uh, attempted murder of a subway motorman in New York. They finally catch him. He goes to trial. During the trial, uh, he gets upset at me when I cross-examined his mother, and he threatens to kill me and the judge. Uh, While uh, he gets out of prison, and uh, because he could only stay till he's 21, and he comes looking for me. Wow. And I come into my office one day, and there are two detectives there. I say, what are you guys doing here? He says, we're here to protect you. And for the next six weeks, my wife uh, had to put on a uh, bulletproof vest on me. I said, I wonder how many people in New York go to work wearing a bulletproof vest. And I had two detectives. And eventually, he got caught for robbing a- an elderly man. And he went to prison for that. And then he just lit his cell on fire while he was there. And he got an additional sentence for that. 
And then while he's in prison, a reporter goes to visit him and he excuses himself. He goes to the bathroom. He comes out with a shiv, stabs a guard, just missing his heart, gets convicted for attempted murder of a prison guard, uh, gets a life sentence and is the only prisoner, the only prisoner in New York state history to be placed in a plexiglass cell where he's monitored 24 hours a day. He's allowed one hour out for, uh, you know, exercise. But he's still in prison today. I think recently they moved him out of his plexiglass cell because he's now about 60 years old. But uh, he was the most violent uh, juvenile in New York State history. Yeah. So, Robert, uh, before we jump into your career prosecuting drug crimes, I, I, let's just get talk about philosophy for a second in terms of uh, juvenile offenders. Just I want to pick your brain yeah. for a second. Um, what's your general take on? Whether and I mean, Willie Basket seems like a really extreme case of somebody that is just kind of a bad apple from jump and you're never going to rehabilitate him. And he's just going to be a criminal no matter what. He's a guy who has to be warehoused. Correct. Right. And I know there's been some famous cases that I've covered here in Michigan that unfortunately seem to follow the same pattern. One was a, a, a. in the 1990s, it was a, a, a 12-year-old that got charged with a murder named Nathaniel Abraham. Um, he was the youngest person in the history of Michigan to get charged with a the murder. Uh, they, they, they put him uh, into the juvenile home until he was 18. And since he's come out, it's just been problem after problem after problem. Uh, the, the more high-profile case that I was involved in was the White Boy Rick case. Uh, which is a lot more complicated and has a lot more mitigating circumstances. But this was a, you know, a 14 year old kid that was recruited by the FBI and DPD out of junior high school to work drug cases for them. And then when they got all they could get from him, they, you know, they kind of sucked him dry and they make all these huge busts. They lock him up and he's being held now, granted, he had done some stuff without yeah. the government as a teen that he deserved to be locked up for. But I guess uh, what's your take on the the amount of time somebody that does a really serious crime when they're 13, 14, 15? And then do you think there is the possibility that just because they did that in their teens, can they eventually become contributing members of society? Yeah, I mean, look, it depends on the individual about rehabilitation. Certainly, I've seen violent offenders who've come clean and they've led a good life. But then you got people like Willie Boskett who are just a danger to society. And those people have to be warehoused and they have to be kept out of, of society. You know, as a result of the Boskett case, New York changed the law and allowed juveniles who were 13 for murder, 14 and 15 for other violent crimes they could be, depending on what the DA and the court decided, could be tried as adults. And a 13-year-old murderer could get up to nine, nine years to life. Now, as a result of that case, other states in the country now adopted the same philosophy and allowed juveniles to be prosecuted as, as adults. I'll tell you this, Scott, before the Bosket case, the theory was, What's in the best interest of the juvenile and not what was in the best interest of society? The Mm. Botskid case turned the tables a little bit and said, we can't just think about the best interests of the child. we got to think about the danger to the community and and society itself. And if these kids are that violent and we got to put them away so that society will be safe. And, And that's really what it is today. Although I think because of the progressive movement now, you're seeing it sort of turn the other way now with, again, well, let's think about the kids again and and what's in their best interest, which I think is a very dangerous yeah, it's a philosophy thing. to have. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I'm uh, one of my father's law partners was representing Nathaniel Abraham, our former law partners. Yeah. And uh, the last thing I'll say about this is so he does his time in the juvenile uh, detention for five years or whatever. Or six, seven years. Yeah. And this was a big case in Detroit. So when he comes out, he's on the front page of the newspaper. Right. And this attorney seemed to think that it was okay for Nathaniel to walk out of the detention center in like literally like a pimp suit. 
And I'm thinking to myself, what message are we sending? Like the lawyer should have before. I understand this is what you want to wear. I understand. But this is not what we're wearing to meet the cameras. No, not a good idea. Scott. Right. Right. Yeah. So, and then it didn't and turn what, out well. He's been back, you know, back in prison. I think he's yeah. there now. And it's just it's sad. He was 12 years old. Obviously didn't have any uh, supervision with his family was go acting crazy. And it's been a you'll, you'll notice in every one of these cases, the kids have a history of committing crimes yeah. at an early age. They go yeah. they go to one juvenile facility after another and, and it doesn't doesn't help them. They don't come out rehabilitated. And then you get a guy like Willie Boskin. And, you know, when he got out also, he was on the front page of the Daily News, you know, uh, teen killer freed. Yep. And of course, now six weeks later or two months later, he's back in jail again. So it's it, there's no easy answer to this. But so how, how, yeah, yeah. Let, let's talk about how you got into prosecuting drug crimes. How do you jump from uh, the juvenile to the uh, drug space? Well, first, let me say. Uh, you know, I, I was in a, a prosecutor in the Manhattan DA's office, the number one prose local prosecutor's office in the country. You know, started with Tom Dewey, who later ran for governor, ran for president. He was the guy who who prosecuted Lucky Luciano. Lucky Luciano right. <laughs> yeah. And then he was replaced by Frank Hogan. And Frank Hogan did the Fulton Fish Market case and Joe Saxadonis and, and um you know, all these uh, gangsters and murderers. And then Robert Morgenthau came in and he he was, a you know, a, a famous crime buster. And Morgenthau did, uh, uh, you, you know, all the carding cases in New York and got rid of the, the knocked out the families who basically had taken over the whole carding. All the sanitation, all the san uh, sanitation. Or yeah, oh, yeah. All the trash. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you if you were, were, for example, in the garment industry and you had all your your trash that you were taking out, you didn't have a choice of who you would pick. You were told right. you, you could do your stuff here and you were paying a lot of money for that. And if you wanted to decide to pick another company, well, you may not have a, your, your your premises might be burned down. But yeah. Morgenthau went in, they did an undercover operation and basically they, they cleaned up that entire industry. So. I, I was, uh, after I left juvenile, I was a trial bureau chief. I tried a number of big cases, homicides. And then in 1984, he says, look, we got a problem in special narcotics. Now, let me explain to the, your listeners and viewers what special narcotics is. The, the Rockefeller laws created, drug laws created special narcotics because of what was going on with New York and heroin in the 70s and 80s and everything going on. It is the only office in the entire United States devoted solely to the investigation and prosecution of felony drug crimes. And it has citywide jurisdiction in all of New York City. Now, I was there for seven years as the number two, the chief assistant, when the guy who was the special prosecutor named Sterling Johnson became a federal judge, I was unanimously appointed by the five district attorneys of New York City to become the special prosecutor. And this was during the crack crisis. And the number of cases had just ballooned. I mean, we're talking about it had taken over everything. And uh, in fact, while, while the crack crisis was happening, uh, there was a an individual who was testifying against one of the drug organizations and he was being guarded. And one of the police officers who was guarding him was a police officer by the name of Eddie Byrne. And Eddie yeah. Byrne was sitting in his police car in Queens when two guys come up and shoot him multiple times, killing him, which of course was a very tragic event and a front page event. And it led to the mayor at that time, Ed Koch, creating what they call TNT, tactical narcotics teams. And they went after all the uh, drug gangs in the city. Every other day in New York City, there was a drive-by shooting, one drug gang shooting somebody else. And it, it became an intolerable situation. The city was racked with crime. You had squeegee men, you had graffiti artists. You, had, you couldn't walk on Times Square in New York because you'd be afraid you were being mugged. So the city devoted thousands of police officers now to TNT, TNT, which is called Tactical Narcotics Teams. And I'm sitting there with less than 90 assistants, and I'm dealing with 7,000 crack cases and heroin and cocaine cases a year. And we're doing investigations with the NYPD, 
with the state police and with the DEA and the Drug Enforcement Task Force, which was made up of New York City police, New York State police, and the DEA agents. And we went after all these organizations. As I said uh, at that time, you got to cut off the head of the snake because buying these you know, guys who are selling drugs on the street, they mean nothing because they're interchangeable parts. You know, mm-hmm. one guy gets arrested, so you want to go after the top of the organization. And that's what we were thinking. So our our investigations not only covered New York, they went not only throughout the country, they went all the way back to Colombia and South America to go after this. And, you know, we, we had to deal with undercovers who risked their lives to get into these organizations. When we took that down major organizations and made major seizures. In fact, we took down 1,500 kilos. That was a boat that was built in Ecuador, and it had a sealed compartment, and it had cement around it. And they did a trial run, Scott. They they sent 600 kilos to Australia. Yeah. And they said, well, that's great. Now they put 1,500 kilos in this compartment. These are, and, these are like colossal packages. I mean. Colossal packages. And they sailed the boat. What they didn't know is we had an informant, which is what you really need to make these huge yeah. cases. The boat sails, and in Galveston, Texas, we unload, we unload the 1,500 kilos, and the boat comes to New York, and they think that the drugs are still on the boat. So we say to the guy who's, who sent the drugs, okay, we want to be paid now, our guys, because we, we sent the drugs. So he says, well... Uh, I got a meeting. Uh, I, 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 I'm not coming to you, to America. Well, they meet him in Switzerland. They do they, they they do the deal. They take the money and they arrest him, and then they take him back to New York from from Switzerland. And of course, he gets a life sentence. And meanwhile, three thousand pounds, over three thousand pounds of cocaine are, are taken off the street. <laughs> and then, and then in 1995, it even gets better. A truckload of carrots, huge bin, Scott. And this I mean, this was like bins. when I when I first when I first started to research Robert. Yes. This carrot case was the first thing that popped up, and when I got on the phone, with him, I was like, "Tell me about the carrot case." Yeah, so the carrot case, it, these huge bins, they they weigh about uh, over a thousand pounds, but they're they're carrots are put in there for horses. So they were going to Aqueduct Racetrack, and they were going to be eaten by horses. We we knew something was up, so this truck comes from Mexico into Texas. Now the carrots are loaded on onto the truck. The truck comes to New York. We pull the truck over. They take the bins off the truck, and now they go through this. So there's carrots in the truck. They take the carrots out, and what do they find? The biggest seizure in New York City history: two tons, two tons of cocaine with a value of God knows how many tens and hundreds of millions of dollars that was worth. And it had a huge impact on the distribution market in New York for a while. It was just an unbelievable seizure. And this was the, this was really the drug boom in our country. I mean, obviously there had been narcotics up until the eighties, but in the eighties, the prices all went down and it wasn't, or at least when we're talking about cocaine, it wasn't just the upper Upperly mobile people that could use it, it it trickled down into the oh yeah, uh, yeah into the poorer know, neighborhoods was, and and just wrecked havoc. Oh yeah, I mean it, it was killing thousands of people. And what what just to give you an idea of how crazy this thing was, we always think about drug deals and you know hundred dollar bills and they they get these stacks of hundreds and they add up to millions. The DEA pulled over a van. And they open up the van, and money starts flying out of the van. And why? Because there were ones, fives, tens, and twenties, which off, was yeah. what people were paying for crack. You know, you were paying three, five, ten dollars for uh, you know a vial, a vial of crack, and it it was just unbelievable. And we led the nation in search warrants. We led the nation in wiretaps, in seizures, and. Um, in number of drug arrests and indictments. I mean, 1995, 7,000 indictments, which was just an un- unreal figure. It, you know, I'm interested to uh, get your take on this. When I when I do talks about um, the 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 drug game in America yeah. in in the 80s, I make a 
a really distinct delineation where I say before the 1980s and, and the crack boom, you had a lot of money being made, but it was all uh, the organization. If there were organizations, it was all top heavy. The top guys were making all the money. When Correct. you hit the 1980s, the workers could start getting rich. And yes. In, in Detroit, yeah. you had 15, 15, 16 year old kids showing up at BMW dealerships and paying cash. And the cops that are chasing them around are are making fifteen thousand dollars a year. Yeah, and they got a teenager exactly right. walking into a a car dealership giving fifty k in cash, and that I mean, didn't exist before. The, the young guy, the the younger lower tier guys, couldn't make the money that they could make in the eighties and nineties. Yeah, without question. You know, you got to remember early on. You know, it, and you know this better than anybody. I, I, you had uh, Paul Castellano. He didn't even want the mob to get involved in the drug game. And you had heroin coming in from, uh, you know, Afghanistan. And But now you had a wide scale uh, operation. I mean, this stuff was coming in from South America, from Colombia. And and then, of course, when the Colombians, when they started getting busted, they 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 became very smart. They said, you know what, we'll produce it, but we're going to give it to the Mexicans to distribute it. And 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 that's what, uh, you know, happened. So, well, and, yeah, I was say, and you have a situation where um, you have the uh, the guys that were. I think with the with the mafia specifically, you had it wasn't I don't think it was anything about morals or ethics like they tried to they tried to like sell that in the you know kind of the Godfather narrative that yes you know we we, we keep you know we keep our our communities clean and we don't want yeah, to sell to the blacks right yeah right yeah black. gambling is is a is an honorable uh yeah. criminal criminal behavior but in reality. They they just understood that the sentences were much harsher. The destruction that those busts were going to do to those organizations were going to be much larger. So, and and in a lot of ways, they just were like, "Don't deal." It, it went from "Don't deal drugs" to "Don't get caught." <laughs> I, <laughs> you're uh, right. right, but but you know, it's a, it, it was a different ball game, and and you know, they were terrific salesmen, the Colombians. In 1993, the number two guy in DEA in New York comes to see me, and he says, we got a problem. I said, well, what, what's the problem? He says, the Colombians now are getting into the heroin business. Yep. And I said, you got to be kidding me. He says, no. He says, not only that, the heroin is so pure, it, you don't have to inject it. You could just snort this heroin now. And he says, and they have an existing market. So what they're doing is they're giving samples. Well, just just like you would market any product. We're giving you samples. They're giving their guys samples of heroin to try just to get used to it. And then now they, they're opening up a new market. And that started again, the, the growth of heroin yep. in New York and throughout the country because they were getting this heroin. Didn't have to be you know, injected. It could be snorted. It was much purer than what we had seen in the 70s and the 80s. And it was a low price. And that and that's how we got all these people again getting involved with heroin and injecting themselves and everything. So fast, fast forward 30 years and we have the opiate epidemic that we have now. Yes. Um, you know, so in a lot of ways it was foreshadowing it. And I'm not heroin never went away per se, but never. Coke was really the the Coke drug of choice in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. And then Coke, from about Coke the mid 90s, yeah, mid 90s now, uh, heroin's has come back ferociously. And it and and you know, again, not to editorialize or or go too deep down this rabbit hole, but there's a big difference between the heroin epidemic that we've seen in America the last 15, 20 years. And the heroin epidemic that existed in the you know fifties and sixties, now it's into the white suburbs. That's right. That, that's a big difference. It yeah. used to be you know in the inner city, you, the blacks. Now now it's everybody. Well, because it course, starts with the pill. The pills. They don't realize that those pills that they are popping are actually heroin. They don't. They don't. Yeah. Make the, they don't do the math yeah. in their head. 
you know, but, you know, the drug market is an evolving thing. So, you know, crack was the big thing then. It took over in the 80s and 90s. Then you had the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, you got over 100,000 people now ODing every year in the United States. It's it's amazing. And then there's the club. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, and then you got 136, average of 136 people dying a day from the opioid crisis. Yep. Just by that. And of course, now you got fentanyl, which is now the new thing, yep. which is the most deadliest of all the drugs we've seen. Yep. So, you know, we got we got big problems here. And, you know, the thing with the opioids is that it was marketed as it's you know, it's a le- yeah. it's a legal drug. It's, it's legal, it's gonna help you with pain. Yeah, it's gonna help. So doctors are gonna addict out- you. Yeah, you know. Doctors were writing out prescriptions like they were candy, yeah. you know, you know, it's a painkiller here. We're giving you this prescription. And then it just got worse. And then you even had doctors in my old office, special narcotics, convicted the first doctor yeah. for, you know, writing all these prescriptions. So it, it's it, it's not a good situation. And, it, and it's not going to stop anytime soon. You know, we got our hands full. Yeah, I was going to say that it it becomes you're talking about evolution. It's like the pills are synthetic heroin and the people that are consuming them don't realize that. And then the, the money dries up. They can't pay for the $10 a pill or $20 a pill. And then they realize, Oh, I can go get a $5 bag of heroin and just inject it. Right. And, and then though, know, it's just, you know, it's just, uh, it, it, it's, it's and, and, you know, my, of our my big thing right is, and I write about it in the book, the government has done nothing. I mean, you don't hear a word about it in the presidential election. Nothing. It's, yep. it's and and people are just dying every day. Yeah, yep. I mean, to have a you've had over a million Americans die of overdoses so far in the twenty yep. first century. That's a lot. More people are dying from overdoses than they are from the COVID epidemic is that 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 that's really a sad situation and then you know what you have with this also is you have you have crime people have to pay for their drugs right then then the ripple effects go to yeah you know you you look when i was when i was the special prosecutor one of the things we did is we knocked off all of these violent gangs that you were getting all these drive-by shootings and Rudy Giuliani was the mayor at that time, and Rudy was sane. And uh, you had him, and you had Brat was the police commissioner. And the city tr- was transformed from the mid 90s to about 10 years ago, the lowest crime rate in America, the safest city in America. Now, the tables have turned again. You, you're, you, you're large, violent issues with violent crime, Times Square. People are afraid to go to Times Square again. As I say in the book, we're headed back to the bad old days of the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And, you know, unless we get a grip on this, things are not going to get better, Scott. They're going to they're 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 headed. We're headed yep. south. And then the, you know? and then there's all this legalization um, of cannabis. And I'm not saying that that's not a, a good yeah. thing, but there I also think. There's a and I'm going down the rabbit hole. I said I was going to go down, yeah. uh, but yeah. and I'm interested. I'm interested to get your opinion on this. Um, I, I get a lot of people that come to me and want yeah. to talk to me about this and say, "Well, isn't it great that uh, we're eliminating the the black market in in the cannabis space?" And I'm like, "What are you talking about? The legalization supercharges the black market." Now you got it right, right? You, <laughs> so you got not, it right, my friend. Right. You know, you look look what happened in Oregon. They legalized even uh, uh, low doses of heroin for personal use. The governor just they issued a, a state of emergency yeah, in Oregon right. because they couldn't. This thing got out of control. You know, I always say, you know, oh, we're gonna uh, a drug, we're gonna legalize drugs. Well, you legalize drugs, you legalizing it for everybody. In other words, can a ten year old go in and right. buy drugs? Right. You know, uh, are you gonna make heroin legal? You're gonna make uh, fentanyl legal. Um, once once you impose uh, st- restrictions such as age or whatever, you've created a black market. Yep. And 
And in legalizing drugs, I always say the cure is worse than the disease. The right. numbers have gone up. Be and, careful what you wish for. You know, it, 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 it's a it's a huge mistake. I write about it in the book, and I I I think people don't realize the damage it's going to incur. And we're seeing it in Oregon. We're seeing it in other places where where drugs are legalized. So, well, to, I'll, the last thing I'll say about this is in I know in Detroit, the, yeah. the, the big racket now is for mob guys to go to people that have legal grow licenses. Yeah. And they'll be like, okay, you're le- you're allowed to grow 25 of plants. Guess what, Joe Smith? We got 10 of those plants. 10 of those plants yeah. are ours. <laughs> <laughs> so guys that have no business being able to uh, do legal business in the legal cannabis space right. are still doing legal business in the cannabis space. They're just buffered by five. Yeah. And you know, and you know, these guys are going to move in because yeah. any pl- time, look, you know this better than me. Any time you can make money, yeah, you're you're got you're going to have organized crime guys move in. You know, in my in my second profession, which I which I did afterwards. I, I'll tell you a funny, an interesting story about that. A guy comes to me and he's very upset. And he says, you know, I own this business. And he said, I made friends with this guy. I golf with him. And he says, I'd love to become your partner. He says, fine. Pays him the money, get, gives him some money, becomes his partner. He says, within a month or two afterwards, all of a sudden, he's making these decisions. He's push, pushing out my vendors. He's putting in our vendors. And then he basically says, I'm taking over the, the rest I'm of taking, the you, You're out. Oh, you're out of here now. You're, you're, you're out now. Right. And he comes to see me. And I said, well, let me do a background on this guy. And I you know, check him out. I said, this guy has been in jail twice. He's an organized crime guy. Yeah. He, he took over your business. He said, you know, what should I do? I said, it's a little late in the game now right. to do anything. He you lost you your out. business. And that it's typical of what you're saying, how these guys just move in and, and they take over businesses. It, it It's incredible how this stuff happens so let's let's, let me ask you a question about um i know we're we're kind of all over the place here but i I find this also fascinating uh in between the crack epidemic and this kind of new heroin opiate epidemic we had the influx of club drugs uh, oh yeah i was the club king in new york you know right i was gonna say i i know that so you, you had uh you know, the, the ecstasies and the MDMAs and the GHBs that really yeah. exploded in the 90s. Um, and in New York, you had some pretty famous cases, uh, Michael Alec, Limelight, uh, Peter Gate and all that stuff. I know you had a little bit of stuff to do with that. I prosecuted Peter Gation. Right. Can we <laughs> yeah. talk about that case a little bit? Yeah. So what happened was, is it's a funny story. He later became my client. Uh, Peter Gation you know, a, a interesting figure. There was a, a documentary made out on Peter Gation. You know, he wore a patch, he lost an eye in a, uh, playing uh, hockey when he was a young kid. And he owned all these clubs and thousands of people were going there. I'm not like talking the most about popular, like the most popular clubs in Manhattan. This guy owned in, in the country, right? In the country. I mean, he had, he had the lion Live club USA. He, he had the tunnel. Um, and, People were overdosing in those clubs. They were dying. And the police now put undercovers into the club, and they see what's going on there, drug sales going on there. And Giuliani at this time wanted to get rid of all the clubs. He he just saw them as venues for, for crime and so forth. So people were overdosing. Undercovers went in. They bought drugs there. And... Uh, police come to me and say, look, we want, we want you to prosecute this case. We've got, we've made buys there. We know what's going on. We think Peter is involved. Gation eventually gets arrested. The clubs get uh, uh, taken down. Gation goes to trial in the Eastern District of New York. And he was represented by one of the best defense attorneys in the country, a guy by the name of Ben Brothman, who also yep. at one point, you know, uh, did Sean Combs. He's done a number of people. And and he gets acquitted. Was I he mean, on the was he on the OJ Dream Team? No, Ben. No, no I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I'm thinking of someone. Brought, I'm sorry. No, but Ben was. He, he's been involved with so many big cases, and he was a former colleague of mine. So they they close the the limelight down, and Rudy now puts this task force together, and they go after club after club after club, and. 
basically you couldn't run a club in New York. They they got taken down. And then when I leave the government, uh, these lawyers come to see me. And they say, uh, you know, the tunnel, which is this huge club. And yet, let me tell you something. If you walked into the club, you may never be able to walk out. It was the <laughs> darkest, biggest place I've ever seen, Scott. And I, People go in there for days. Those clubs with, with those club drugs, they have you up for 48 hours partying. Believe it. So I'll, it, it, it's a funny story here. So, so anyway, these lawyers come to see me. And they say, you know, the judge closed down the tunnel. He needs a, a monitor, someone to oversee it, that drugs don't go in there. And we'd like you to be the monitor because I said, you came to the wrong guy. I said, I, 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 I was involved with Peter being arrested. He says, well, you don't understand. Peter, Peter thought you treated him fairly. And if you can put him in jail, he figures you could keep him out of jail. <laughs> so I go in there and uh, I, I become the monitor of, of the tunnel. And uh, it was almost impossible to keep drugs. And we had to search people coming in there. And then every club was getting closed in New York. And they were coming to me to monitor these clubs. Right. You got I, a new cottage industry. <laughs> I, I, I was now the king of clubs in New York. No square of man could they find <laughs> He's the king of clubs in New York. So I'm I'm monitoring, you know, all, all these nightclubs. And uh, Rudy was just intent on, on, on closing them. He had this thing about nightclubs. Uh, and, and look, he was right. There was a ton of drugs that were going on in those clubs and you, it was impossible to, you had, you know, your fentanyl, not fentanyl, but you had ketamine, you had all these date, date rape drugs that were going on there and people overdosing and people dying. And it was just, it was Scott, it was just a, an, an awful situation. What the hell was going on there? And, and people can, uh, have their opinions about Rudy now. I know I do. I don't want to get into yeah. that, but but I will say that every person I've ever spoken to that worked underneath him, uh, whether it be uh, police officers, prosecutors, uh, federal agencies that had to work with um, yes. New York, at, both with him when he was a, a, pro, a U.S. prosecutor as well as mayor. Yes, everybody, yes. everybody has said that there was no... Uh, superior that they had that was more willing to help them in their law enforcement duties as opposed to other um, bureaucratical red tape undermining. They said that I've talked to countless guys that say Rudy always got them what they needed when they needed it. Yeah, that's um, true. And helped streamline a lot of the bullshit red red tape that prevented yeah, cases listen, from he, yeah you know he he went uh you're right i mean look he he basically cleaned up the city right he, he was, brought he brought in right. bill bratton who did a great job as police commissioner you know he gave us all the resources we needed to go after these drug organizations and knocked out not only the local gangs but went after you know all the uh you know the, the big players i mean we really took down some huge drug organizations yep. And, you know, they were, let me tell you, it, it was like a battle. They they would come up with technology. We would we would now match them. So chess uh, game. Yeah, it was a chess game. So in one case, this is one of my favorite cases, they, they, they rent a house in Long Island in a very lovely neighborhood, you know, suburban neighborhood in Long Island. And they're told what they're doing here. The Colombians got smart. They kept the money in one place. The drugs were kept someplace right. else. So this was a place where they were holding the money. So they said, here's what we want you to do. We want you to get TV Guide every week. Get it sent to you because that's the American Bible is TV Guide. <laughs> and he said, hey, we want you to get TV Guide, and we want you to get the New York Times sent to your house. These guys couldn't even speak English. Get the New York Times sent to your house. Make sure your garbage is out on the street and, and so forth. And, you know, we get on a wire and eventually we bust it. But, you know, the newspapers called it the Apple Pie Gang because they just <laughs> wanted to fit in. And, you know, and no one would be aware that they were involved with this stuff. And and that and and that's what they did. And it was always a, a big deal trying to chase the, the money and so yeah. forth. Well, isn't that the the kind of like first rule of busting these these organizations? Follow the money. 
Follow money, but it's interesting. You know, the DEA, I would go, Tom Constantine was the head of the DEA in the nineteen uh, mid-1990s. He was former head of the state police in New York. And I go down to Washington and I meet with him and he's showing me all these figures. We confiscated X hundreds of thousands of, of, of kilos and millions and this. I said, Tom, that's great. I said, but this is a business. These guys are into it. For the money. You They've know? already collected the money once the drugs are out on the street. That's right. I said, all you're doing is taking drugs. That's the cost of doing their business. But unless you get that money that they're trying to launder, they won the game. You gotta go, you gotta go after the money. And you know what? It really had an effect. He says, I agree with you. And you know, they were doing it anyway, but now they were changing their tactics. Now we gotta go after their businesses. Now we gotta go after the money that that they're sending down. And, you know, in the book, I write about this tom- crazy tomato can. Yeah, I, want, I, was gonna, let's, I was about to get to that. So let's tell that. So uh, that is, I, I think I think your listeners will get a kick out of this case. So the DEA gets up on this organization and there's this great undercover the guy's name is Jerry Spezial. He, he was the best in the business. Yep. He composes anything. And he gets involved with the, he goes to Colombia, goes to Brazil. He gets into these organizations anyway. They come down with this uh, they get a hit on this organization that's moving big money for 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 the cartels, and they they ask, come to me and they get a they get a wire, and the guys in the wire now come and say, look, you know the money is being stashed in a place in Long Island, but we we don't know where it is. And Jerry becomes, he's like a telecommunications expert. They figure out that the calls are being pinged off a cell in in Brentwood, Long Island. And under the wire, they get something that these guys are going to come to get the money. And uh, the the guy in the stash house, which is a mansion, says, look, before you come to me, stop off at McDonald's, get me an Egg McMuffin, no cheese, and orange juice, and a medium coffee. And they somehow figure out where this McDonald's is located. So they set up surveillance. They got cars all over the place in the parking lot. They put a guy in McDonald's. And all of a sudden, a Buick Regal pulls up with three guys in it. One guy comes out, he goes into McDonald's, and he says, I want an Egg McMuffin, a Spanish-speaking guy, I want an Egg McMuffin, a medium coffee, and an orange juice. <laughs> now, the, now all of a sudden, the call comes, they're here. So now the guy takes out the water, he drives, they follow, he goes to some mansion, and now they see the guys coming out and loading up a car with these big cans of red pack crushed tomatoes and they load them in a car. Now they follow them to a warehouse in Plainview, Long Island. They go into the warehouse and they're watching and these cans are being put with other cans. They're being put on pallets and sealed and they're being put onto a truck, a white truck. And they start following the truck and on the wire, they understand that the truck is going to go to Florida. And they're going to follow this truck from Long Island all the way to Florida. While they're following it, they get a call from the guys in Florida and said, you better stop the truck before it gets to this warehouse. We may lose it. There's all types of these trucks with the same wording. We could lose the truck. Stop it before it gets here. Now, these guys haven't slept for two days. They follow this truck and it goes through New Jersey, through Delaware, through Maryland, through Washington and into Virginia into North Carolina, and Spezial was in one car, hasn't slept, they crash into a toll booth, they get into an accident, they ditch that car, they jump into another car, they keep following him, and finally they decide they're going to pull the car over in North Carolina, they get an order from the judge to seize the truck, to take the driver out, he's got $15,000 on him, because that's what he was paid to take the truck down. Spezial turns around, they speed the truck back to New York, they get stopped in Virginia, by a major in the state troopers, and they're told, you know, they, they give them a big problem about the truck, and Spezial and his boss, Sergeant Denny Beach, says, look, 
if you don't let this truck go, we're going to arrest you, Major. Right. This we're local this local yokel has no idea that he's disrupting no, a you're major. You're interfering with our investigation. We're going to arrest you for interfering with the federal investigation. And finally, he lets the truck go. They speed back to New York. They get to DA headquarters in, in New York City. Spezial secures a dumpster. He gets a forklift to take the pallets out. He sends somebody to buy three dozen can openers to open these cans. And I'm I'm back in my office and I'm saying to Jerry, I'm saying, Jerry, do you realize that if there's no money in those cans, my face is going to be on the front page of the New York Post and they're going to, and who's going to pay for all these cans or the, you know, the, the warehouse for 5,000, 5,500 cans of tomato sauce? Yeah. You know? <laughs> So I'm saying you got to call me every few hours. Let me know what's going on here. Three hours, five hours. They're opening up nothing. I mean, they they started early in the morning. It's nothing. They've opened up 2,000 cans. Every one of them has tomato sauce. They had dog sniffing, uh, drug sniffing dogs. Nothing. They take an x-ray machine. They x-ray the cans. Nothing. <laughs> You know, and I can tell my blood pressure is now rising as as they get to four thousand cans of tomatoes, and they found nothing. Your career is <laughs> that's it. I, your I'm eyes. done. Cross I'm, your I'm, eyes. I'm, I'm I'm done. And somebody orders a a pizza. They said no tomato sauce, just a white pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, they get to five thousand cans. And all of a sudden, I get a call. We found something. Well, what'd you find? There are some cans that are carrying olives that are lined with with carbon paper so they can't be x-rayed. And in a a, uh, a, a Ziploc bag is $15,000. So now they start taking more cans off. Finally, they're at the last 500 cans, and they all have olives in them. And the olives aligned it with this carbon paper, and everyone has fifteen thousand dollars in it, and they end up seizing one point eight million. <laughs> and then, of course, you know they turn people and everything. They get it, end up seizing eight million dollars. The organization goes down, and it becomes a national investigation. And it was just, you know, I slept well that night. <laughs> Something to be but proud was- of, man. I, a lot, I, lot on the line. A lot of uh, you know, you're like the craps table, man. You got to make sure you don't you don't uh, hit snake eyes. Yeah, no, no, no. We 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 hit our number a couple of times there, but let me tell you that's that's what happens with these investigations, you know. And you need the, you need four things. You need undercovers. You need uh, informants. You need uh, surveillance, and you need wires, and that's how we basically took down all these organizations. What was so your was, la- what was the last case that you worked uh, for for the um, as the top drug prosecutor? Do you remember? You know, I left in November of ninety seven. The big the big case was the two ton seizure in, involving uh, carrots, and some of the stuff, Scott, that you saw here, I got to tell you, greed, you know, is an amazing thing. They had um, they did a story on 60 Minutes about the Dominican Republic and how all these drugs, you know, were coming in through the DR and, and so forth. And they had these two families. They knew each other and these two kids. And the goal was to come to the United States, make enough money to build a mansion in the Dominican Republic. And they both come to New York. One goes back to the DR in a body bag. The other comes back with enough money for the mother to build a house there. And there was this one organization up in Washington Heights. They were they were selling about ten kilos a day for about uh, at that time it was about seventeen eighteen thousand bucks. So six days a week they were selling ten kilos. So one hundred and seventy. That was what they were taking, and obviously they had to they had to buy it. They were, so they were making 170000 a day, six days a week. So you do the math. <laughs> it, it's a lot of money. So now, and they were running a travel agency and they have this a mansion in the, uh, in the DR and they're living in this apartment in Washington Heights that in the winter that basically had no heat and had roaches 
And I'm saying to the guys who are running the wire, I said, these people are nuts. I said, they've made millions and millions of dollars. They got a beautiful house there and they're living, excuse me, in a shithole in Washington yeah, Heights. Roach infested. Right, right. Roach infested place in Washington Heights. And what are they doing there? And then the guys say, well, you know what? It's time we take them down. So they go, they bust these people. They're doing life in prison when they made millions of dollars just sitting there and had a beautiful house. And and why do this? It's it 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 it, it it's all yeah. greed. It's all greed. It's some, but it's, in, it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. in these guys' DNA. I mean, it's hard for people to understand that that well, this guy just did 20 years in prison. Of course he's just gonna or he did 10 years in prison. Of course, he's just going to go fly the straight and narrow now. He doesn't want to go back and do that. It's like, yeah, you're right. thinking like a normal, regular day human being. You're not right. thinking like a criminal that has this embedded in his DNA. Well, this is It's not a question of him uh, not understanding what you're saying. He understands that. And, 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 in, and in theory, he agrees with you. But in practice, he doesn't want to live that life. He wants to live the life of a criminal. And then we had one case where the DEA was following this guy and he's driving a sports car and he's on his phone with his girlfriend. And he says, you know, this is a great day. I feel wonderful. Uh, and he's driving, you know, his uh, Corvette. And the next thing you hear are sirens. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Changing the drop of a dime. Yeah. And he's gone. You know, he's gone for the rest of his life. And, you know, the other thing we did that nobody else did is we forfeited buildings. Apartment buildings we took. What happened is there's there's uh, tons of sales of drugs going on there. The drug dealers have taken over the building. They take over, over the building and they force the tenants to be their couriers yeah. and sellers yeah. if they want to yeah. be yeah. allowed to live there or be allowed to live there. Without, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, violence being done on them. And then there's these kids, you know, who were living there and they can't, you know, they're afraid for the kids. to. So we go to the landlord and we say, we got a problem here. And the landlord you know, he's being paid big bucks. So he, so we finally go in there with U S marshals and we take over the building. We take over the building and now they're searching every apartment. You wouldn't believe this. They open a refrigerator. There's a Coke can. You slip off the top of the Coke can. It's a stash for money and drugs. There's no soda. There's just a stash. They open up the floorboards and there, there's guns under the floorboards. I mean, you know, automatic weapons that are under there. It was just incredible. And that was one of the last, the biggest, you know, seizures we made was taking down this uh, organization. It was just, you know, it, it, I don't know what the ending is to this. I mean, you just can't arrest your way out of it. But the government has to do something where... You know, there's more education, there's more rehabilitation, there's, uh, you know, seizures, but there's no plan that I see that's that's going to end this thing any anytime soon. And, you know, when fentanyl goes away, there'll be a new drug to replace it. It's always it's like that. Well, I think so, one, of, one of the issues just for my kind of amateur socioeconomic yeah. take on it was when. In the 70s and 80s, when the drugs were coming from um, Colombia, Bolivia, yeah. those kind of places, yeah, I'm not saying there weren't multiple cartels. I mean, there were, but you you basically had the like kind of uh, not a you had let's say I, I, and and let me just say someone please correct me if I'm wrong here, but yeah. you didn't have the I guess what I'm saying you didn't have the amount of cartels, the amount of organizations in uh, S Central America and South America as you have in Mexico right now. And, oh. and, th and those organizations didn't have the scope and size of the cartels in Mexico. Oh, so you're right. These, these organizations are so much bigger. Right, and more violent. Right. And they have much more political influence than they've right. ever had. They've taken over, you know, provinces in Mexico. Yeah, it's it's impossible. The government can't deal with it in Mexico now, or the government is complicit right. in it. Right. You know, I had a DEA age and when the um, movie Traffic came out about yep. uh, 20 years 20 ago. 20 years ago, yeah, great movie. Yeah, I, I, I was, the New York Times had myself and a uh, former DEA agent who was in Mexico and some other people reviewed the movie and they asked us about it. And the, and the uh, DEA agent said, 
So you could fill all the honest cops in Mexico on a New York City bus. Yep. And that's because the corruption was so prevalent there. And it still is today. I mean, a police work is an entrepreneurial activity for some people. It's not. Oh, without question. It's not just civil service. No, you're you're right. And the corruption in Mexico is has always been bad. You you can't trust them. And you know, you can't stop the, the drugs from Mexico coming in. And another di- sorry. Yeah. Let's no, say, I was another, another say, difference. Sorry, I keep interrupting. No, I was just gonna say the only way we could do something in this country is we have to make young people believe that doing drugs is socially unacceptable. Yeah. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. So I think my generation, actually, the if you grew up in the 80s, you were inundated with the Nancy Reagan. Um, don't just say it. Don't just say no. Yeah, and I, and I think no. it really I think it I think it made an impact on my generation. And it's the generation after me that didn't really have that, that right. jumped back full, that went you know head first back into the. the You're right, the because world. there was a decline in the late 90s and early 20th century in drug use, drug violence. In the last 15 years, yeah, it's gotten really bad. And, and I think no quick answer. W- one more logistical um, yeah. hurdle that seems to have been eliminated when the uh, wholesale economy went from, let's say, Colombia to Mexico yeah. is Mexico has has. 10 different places they can cross over borders in the United States. Colombia, you had to go from Colombia right. to the Bahamas to Miami. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah, yeah, it's easier now. Yeah, it's it's much easier. But the Colombians were smart. They made a lot of money and they said, you know what, we don't need these headaches. Let the Mexicans do the distribution. They gave it up. And now, of course, you know, the Mexicans are getting the chemicals from China. They're, they're making, you know, they're getting the labs. They're, they're making uh, fentanyl. They're bringing that into the country. And I just read today that, you know, the, they think that the numbers of fentanyl users are going down. But, you know, there's a long way to go. And then what's the next drug that comes after fentanyl? It's, it's, it's not an easy situation. And I don't know what the answer is. but. We got to do something. Well, Robert, I really enjoyed this. You've done it all. You've said it all. You've literally lived a movie script, if not several movie scripts. Uh, Thank you so much for coming in and and sharing your story with us. And yes, I may show my book. We're going to put a link. We're going to put a link for people to click law and disorder. Uh, It's a must read for anybody that's interested in true crime. um, I would say on the East coast, but really anywhere. Uh, Robert, we owe us, we owe a debt to you. You are a true American hero. Well, sure. thank you. But, you know, it's it's what's interesting is this is the first book. One of the reasons I wrote this book was that, you know, you watch Law and Order, you watch all these procedurals. And I say to my I can't watch it. Because I know. They, if you know, do you really because, know it? You know, kind of, they don't they don't tell it like it is. I got to tell you, I was in the courtroom for what, 25 years. And I never like Law and Order, you see. You know, Sam Waters did on one end of the table, then there's the defendant and defense yeah. lawyer at the other end. And he's saying, okay, I'll let your client plead to man one, but he's got to get eight and a third to 25. And the lawyer talks and he says, you know, we'll we'll take seven to 21. And then they, they figure out, okay, whatever. I said, in 23 years, I never sat across the table yeah. from a defendant and his lawyer talking about a plea. That stuff just doesn't happen. What about the timelines on those shows? It goes from arrest to incarceration in like 20 minutes. Yeah, 52 minutes to solve right. a crime, right. you know, right. to do a full yeah. investigation. I watched like the FBI and all this. 52 minutes, we got everything, you know, yeah. and they only have four agents, you know. Right. It's, 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 you know, it, so I wanted to write a book. That tells you how an office runs, how a decision is made, how cases are developed. You just don't see it. It's like a first timer. And if if you're a cop, if you're, you know, you're an agent, you're a crime buff, it really tells you the story of what what happens. And 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 my my story is sort of like the uh, I'm like the guide of it, but it is an it's an amazing story how how a kid from the Bronx who had nothing. No, rose all the way to become America's top drug prosecutor. So, uh, 
you know, so fascinating, is, so compelling, so riveting. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Scott, thank you so much for doing this. You're well, it's great. You're always well, welcome back. Well, we could use you as uh, maybe an analyst or uh, someone that we can you bring wanna, on to, uh, to give us uh, uh, your legal analyst uh, on some on some upcoming cases. I can give you my analyst on the Trump case, but we don't want to get into that. Right <laughs> well, that would be a whole other. I, I, oh, my. I, 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 you know, I've been in that courtroom where that trial is. I must have been in there a hundred times. <laughs> And, you know, one thing you know about a jury is you don't know about a jury. Right. And, uh, you know, and anything can happen. Uh, you know, I, I had a case where I broke a defendant's alibi. He was dead. He was convicted. And then another case, I broke his alibi and he got acquitted. And I, to this day, I can never figure out, you know, why these things happen. But people don't realize that um, I was talking to some family members about this the yeah. other day. And I said, you know. There's an entire space of the legal community that just are jury consultants that you yes. bring these people in. They tell you who to pick on the jury. They research it. They number crunch it. They poll it. And that's their whole job is just to, you know, to Scott, put the, the jury truth of the matter is the truth of the matter is you still don't know. Right. And it's still and it's still not it's still not an exact science. You know, I, I tried a murder case. It's in the book before. I don't I won't keep you much before Judge Burton Roberts. Burton Roberts was quite a character. You know, when they uh, uh, he was the model for for judges in certain movies. And uh, I get before Burt. And we're picking a jury for this murder case. I'm running out of challenges. And maybe some woman who I wouldn't take. Anyway, I end up taking her for the jury. And Bert calls us up to the bench. And we have to tell him about who we're taking and who we're not in the juries. And I said, I have no challenges. And he looks at me, puts a yellow pad up so the jury won't hear. He says, you asshole. He says, how could you? Well, he was a former prosecutor. How could you take that juror number eight? She's a nut. And I said, Judge, I don't think she's a nut. I thought she, you know, she's a reasonable woman. And the jury comes back. The jury it was a six week murder trial. The jury comes back in less than an hour and convicts the guy of murder. And at the end of the trial, I turned to Bert and I said, Judge, so much for that number eight juror. <laughs> and he just puts his head down. He's get out of here. And he just leaves. And, and then just one other quick instance. I'm trying a case once and I'm running out of challenges. And I ended up taking a social worker on the jury. And I the said, bleed heart, bleeding hearts. Oh, God, I'm dead. There's no way I'm getting it. This guy must have been bounced from 100 juries. And the jury comes back and they acquit the guy and, and the ju judge excuses the jury and the juror walk, jurors walk by me and the guy comes up to me and he whispers in my ear and he says, you see, social workers can convict, <laughs> you know, you just, you, Priceless. Just don't, Priceless. you just don't know with the jury, Scott. It, it's, you know, we'll find out in a week or so, though. Yes, we will. Well, it's Robert, fun. thank you so much. Uh, thank you, you're Scott. always welcome back on the show. I hope the OG Nation uh, loves you as much as I do, and I know they will. Uh, Benny, behind the glass, thank you so much. And uh, check out Law and Disorder wherever you can get books. Check it out. Uh, how how it a kid from the Bronx became America's top drug prosecutor. Give it a review on Amazon. Help him get his numbers up and his algorithm up. Uh, this Reviews is, on Amazon are terrific. By the so, way, these are the kind of stories that we live for here on the OG pod. So for Robert and for Ben, I am Scott Bernstein. We'll see you next week. OG pod out.